When you think of Marvel Comics, you think of Spider-Man, and it makes perfect sense. Spider-Man's been the face of the company for decades, and as a concept, he's a license to print money. The X-Men, on the other hand, were so unpopular when Marvel first introduced them, they shadow canceled their comic, meaning they didn't quite stop publishing it, they just stopped creating new stories. But there was actually a time when the X-Men were so popular, they doubled the sales of Spider-Man, and no one else in the comic book industry came close. So Spider-Man enters the 70s as Marvel's crown jewel, right? He's basically been a standout success since the book launched behind only the Fantastic Four. The first animated series, complete with its familiar theme song, had already finished airing. That continues for the duration in the late 1970s when Marvel had to remove barcodes from comics sold to the direct market, and so they replaced them with a small image of Spider-Man's head. And it's worth taking a second look at why that is. We as the audience are very used to modern comics trying to make heroes relatable, very human type of people, but the effects lost on us. Back at the time when Marvel first started doing this, this was kind of revolutionary. Superhero narratives often acknowledge civilian identities, maybe even get some drama out of them, but it was usually pretty minor. Marvel, on the other hand, dialed in on the mundane lives of their characters. Spider-Man was the story of Peter Parker, a thoroughly normal, relatable guy. And you know somebody like Peter Parker. In fact, you're probably Peter Parker. You've probably had some bad breaks. You've had the Parker luck. For the audience at the time, this was powerful stuff. Now, Marvel tried this approach across its entire line with varying degrees of success, focusing on relationships and the personal lives for most of their heroes. But elsewhere, we have lawyers, scientists, a tech billionaire. Nobody in this era is really approachable, at least not in the way that Peter Parker was. And in fact, for Spider-Man, the 1970s are the era where some of his most iconic stories take place. We saw a surprisingly grim turn with the death of Peter's good friend, Captain George Stacy, in the sense that not only was the former officer the father of his girlfriend Gwen Stacy, he was also an ally of Spider-Man, wanting to see the public finally believe in the wall crawler's heroism. But it's a pretty dark story, and it's just the start. The two-part revelation of Harry Osborn's drug problems was a big deal when it was first published. In fact, the original Comics Code Authority standards barred any depiction of drug use, even when it's shown in a negative light. Marvel, of course, ultimately defied the comics code and then published those comics without an approval stamp, and it worked. Not only were those comics extremely successful, they led the comics code being adjusted to allow negative depictions of drug use going forward. And in fact, you could argue that Spider-Man dealt the first blow that would ultimately kill the comics code. And these two are just setting up more impactful and darker stories that come later. The Night Gwen Stacy Died was incredibly successful. While the book had gone through some several potential love interests by that point, those plots only ended up in breakups. But Peter Parker and Gwen Stacy were a firm couple, and in fact, Gwen's dad, George Stacy, died telling Peter to be good to his daughter, and then Spider-Man failed to save her. That scene on the George Washington Bridge became iconic for Spider-Man, and it was arguably Peter's most human moment up to that point, this devastating personal failure. And Stan Lee claimed that Jerry Conway waited until he was heading out of the country before asking permission to kill Gwen off, and that he'd never done it if he'd been paying attention. But it worked. The Green Goblin, secretly industrialist Norman Osborn, had long been an enemy of Spider-Man, first appearing in issue number 14 of Amazing Spider-Man back during the 60s, yet he'd been out of the story for quite some time. Peter, in fact, was convinced Norman had lost all memory of his time as a supervillain, but then he returned for this arc, and it was the moment that brought him to real prominence as one of Spider-Man's main villains. The anger Spidey feels after losing Spider-Gwen is almost enough to get him to kill the Green Goblin. And all this fed into the character arc for Peter's best friend, Harry Osborn. After his father died, Harry's mental state continued to get worse, leading him to become the second Green Goblin. And it's another extremely dark story involving Peter Parker losing people in his life in a way that would have been unthinkable back in the character's original 1960s run. The point is, Spider-Man was a big success for Marvel and he kept succeeding. In fact, this is where secondary titles started getting published by Marvel. Marvel Team-Up featured Spider-Man joining with another Marvel superhero each issue. Spider Super Stories came in to target younger kids. The Spectacular Spider-Man and Giant Size Spider-Man both let readers get more Spider-Man content while waiting for the next issue of the main comic. By contrast, 
The X-Men starts the 1970s as a zombie book. The X-Men book was still technically being published, but it wasn't really running any new material. Instead, it was just reprinting existing stories. Marvel hadn't forgotten the characters, they just made cameos in other books. Magneto and other villains were reused a few times, but the main comic didn't really justify making new content, so they just kept reprinting stuff. Now that changes midway through the decade with Giant Size X-Men number one. This book, which was spearheaded by Lynn Wine, is essentially a soft reboot of the title. The original X-Men have mostly been captured by the living island Krakoa, so Cyclops assembles a new team to go save them. Giant Size X-Men, of course, as you can imagine, was a massive success. This roster of the team is arguably more iconic than the original five, and this is where Wolverine, already a minor Incredible Hulk villain, really rises to prominence. Storm makes her first appearance here alongside Nightcrawler and Colossus. Marvel, truth to tell, really just wanted a team that felt more global, and of course they succeeded in doing that. The relaunch was a massive success, and it led to the revival of the main X-Men title, now focused almost exclusively on this new team. And it was actually much more of a success than anybody had expected. Lynn Wine had intended to release quarterly giant size specials to kind of continue the X-Men story, but instead, the sales were so strong, the book was slated to be released bi-monthly. And since Lynn Wine's schedule was already so busy, the new book was handed over to his assistant, some guy that nobody had ever really heard of, named Chris Claremont. Now the Claremont era became a golden age for X-Men fans. The next five years aren't all that well remembered now but they were extremely successful and set up what would come later. And in fact, this was the time when shape-shifting assassin Mystique was introduced. It's when the X-Men went into space and met the Shi'ar Imperium. And it's when Jean Grey went from Marvel Girl, effectively the damsel in distress, to the power set and character she was best known by, the Phoenix. And so by 1982, the X-Men were Marvel's top selling title. And in fact, this would continue for 17 years uninterrupted, actually outlasting Chris Claremont himself. The 80s are not really a bad era for Spider-Man, that is an important thing to state here, but they lack the big hit stories that define the book in the 1970s. There are some memorable moments, the mystery of the Hobgoblin, the impact of Kraven the Hunter's most desperate attempts to kill Spider-Man in Kraven's last hunt, Mary Jane Watson being introduced as a serious romantic option, leading to her marriage with Peter Parker, but it's only at the tail end of this decade that you get the book really starting to reassert itself. And in fact, another character typifies that more than any other, Venom. Now, the symbiote is technically introduced back in Secret Wars in 1984 as Marvel's Black Spider-Man costume, and it's not until issues 299 and 300 that readers are actually introduced to Venom. And Venom's story is more relevant to where Spider-Man is going, which was into the 1990s. So we'll put a pin in this because, you know, we're going to circle right back around to Venom. But circling back to the X-Men, the 1980s are the height of the Claremont era. All those iconic stories that Spider-Man had in the 70s, the X-Men got theirs in this decade. The Dark Phoenix Saga, Days of Future Past, God Loves Man Kills, the books get hit after hit after hit after hit, and it's largely attributed to Claremont's writing. He had more than his share of action scenes, but this was the guy who would juggle personal stories for a massive extended cast. Everybody's relationships matter, from Colossus Bond with his sister, to the quasi-maternal relationship between Storm and Kitty Pride, to Professor Xavier's growing romance with the Shi'ar leader Lalandra, and this is also where the X-Men start to get a ton of books. Thanks to the massive extended cast of characters, most of these are focused on heroes readers are already familiar with. X-Factor starred the original five X-Men, Excalibur had Kitty Pride, Nightcrawler, and another Phoenix known as Rachel Summers, which joined Captain Britain out in England, and of course, Wolverine gets his own solo title. Even at this point, he was popular enough to justify that. But the comic spinoff that really gives way to how big the X-Men have gotten by this point is one of the first spinoffs, The New Mutants. Now this featured an entirely new cast of characters, only sharing the basic premise. There are a new group of mutant heroes being trained by Professor X. Writer Louise Simonson recalled that the book was actually not her plan or even Chris Claremont's. Instead, it originally came from Marvel's editor-in-chief Jim Shooter, who wanted to preempt any competitors getting out a rival mutant title. That way, Marvel would really just be their own competition, and it worked. 
it's sold. New Mutants, with its entirely original cast, runs all the way through the 1980s. All those books were successful, and they started working together. The first big comics crossover storyline comes during this period in time, with the Mutant Massacre briefly interrupting New Mutants, X-Factor, Uncanny X-Men, and even Thor and Power Pack to tell a single interconnected story about an attack by a new villain group called the Marauders. It's such a big sales success that a big annual crossover becomes a tradition for the X-Men line. But the X-Men are officially on top of the world at this point. Forget Spider-Man. The sales figures for Uncanny X-Men are so good. Comic book stores are ranking everything else compared to how close they come to that month's issue of the X-Men. But now we finally reach the 1990s and it's time for both sides of this little race to ultimately fall. Spider-Man by this point is starting to rally. The creation of Venom is a big move towards making the Spider-Man mythos more popular. By 1992, we've already gotten a second symbiote in the form of Carnage. What some fans now may have forgotten is the importance of Venom's original artist, Todd McFarlane. His detail, heavy style, and with its varied acrobatic poses and intricate web strands was extremely successful and built him an incredibly strong personal brand. But that was not enough for Todd McFarlane. He was still working on existing scripts and wanted to move on to doing his own thing. And so instead of having to continue working under David Nicolini, Marvel handed him his own Spider-Man book, Adjectiveless Spider-Man to do basically whatever it was that he wanted to do. This arguably backfired. While sales were extremely good, this was largely influenced by the quote-unquote comic speculator bubble of the 1990s and McFarlane's strong name recognition. Fans were not really reacting well to the writing. What's worse might be the content. The Perceptions arc, running from issues 8 to 12, features police corruption, child abuse, and murder. And this is just a far cry from classic Spidey, and it strained McFarlane's relationship with editorial. With just 15 issues done, he ultimately left the company. Marvel's biggest, most successful book was officially in trouble. But over at the X-Men line, things weren't necessarily getting any better. A big new relaunch was being planned with the division between blue and gold teams, but inside the bullpen, there's a growing conflict between Chris Claremont and artist Jim Lee. This time, instead of giving the artist his own book to work on, the X-Men editor Bob Harris gave Jim Lee control of the story. So Chris Claremont was basically just the guy who was writing the dialogue. And so the job was starting to wear on him. The sheer profit kept Claremont around for a little while longer, but ultimately wanting to secure his exit from Marvel. But right after the new X-Men number one becomes the single best-selling comic of all time with over 8.1 million issues sold to stores and nearly $7 million in profit for Marvel, the writer who made all of this possible, Chris Claremont, bails on the book. Now, this shouldn't be a problem for Marvel, right? They've still got Jim Lee, the guy they had plotting the whole book, only Jim Lee's about to leave too. Remember Todd McFarlane? He and a bunch of other just high profile creators are forming a new company called Image Comics and Todd invites Jim Lee to join him. And so Bob Harris basically forced Chris Claremont out of the book for nothing. This goes into the 1990s, what we call the dark age of comic books, but I feel like that's a discussion for a different time. Let me know if you guys want to see that down in the comments section. Thank you all for watching, and I will catch you all later. Peace.